All right, Colossians chapter 3, again this morning. Colossians chapter 3, and if you have some of those nice um, ribbons in your Bible, you might want to put one in Ephesians chapter 5, because we'll be looking at a parallel passage there as well. This week is a high point in the calendar for Christians, and I encourage you in your daily devotions to spend some time in the Gospels, uh, reading the narratives of Christ's suffering and crucifixion and resurrection. I think it's always important for us to go back to those events and see our Lord in the flesh, um, undergoing what he went through on our behalf, embracing death and everything that went with it. So spend some time making this week special and, and dedicated to the Lord in preparation for Good Friday. Uh, Pastor Tim will bring the message, and then also we'll have sunrise service up on the golf course. Hopefully it will be warmer, and everything will be melted by then and dry. And then we'll have our breakfast afterwards of pancakes and then uh, Easter Sunday service. Also, I want to uh, ask you as a church to be in prayer, uh, concerted prayer for our time with Pastor Nook. He is a guest of Dan Haynes and a faithful, long-term, seasoned pastor uh, from Africa. Um, in thinking about preparing for this, um, I really want to pray for um, a, a real welcome for him and also a chance for us to really honor him and show him honor as a pastor. Um, a, a, a passage that came to mind regarding this is in Philippians chapter 2, and it's towards the end. I want you to just listen to what Paul has to say about Epaphroditus and his role um, in the church at Philippi and also to him personally. It starts in verse 19. But I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly so that I also may be encouraged when I learn of your condition. Paul is writing from prison. Uh, he's eager to find out how this young church is doing. He is sending this, this letter back with Epaphroditus and then hopes to send Timothy to them in the near future. He says, For I have no one else of kindred spirit who will genuinely be concerned for your welfare, for they all seek after their own interests, not those of Christ Jesus. But you know of his proven worth that he served me in the furtherance of the gospel like a child serving his father, speaking of Timothy. Therefore, I hope to send him immediately as soon as I see how things go with me. And I trust in the Lord that I myself also will be coming shortly. But, he says, I thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, who is also your messenger and minister to my need. That word messenger there is apostle, lowercase a. This church had sent Epaphroditus to Paul to minister to him in prison, and now Paul is sending him back to them with this letter. It says, Because he was longing for you all and was distressed because you had heard that he was sick, for indeed he was sick to the point of death, but God had mercy on him, and not on him only, but also on me, so that I would not have sorrow upon sorrow. If Epaphroditus had gone to Paul to minister to him in prison, and then Epaphroditus had gotten sick and then died, it would have heaped sorrow upon sorrow for Paul. He says, Therefore I have sent him all the more eagerly, so that when you see him again you may rejoice, and I may be less concerned. Receive him then in the Lord. And I think this is the, the point of the passage. Receive him then in the Lord with all joy, and hold men like him in high regard, because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was deficient in your service to me. And from what uh, I've heard from Dan Haynes about Pastor Nook is that he has, from the very beginning of his faith in Christ, um, had a very strong testimony and also has, it has been costly for him in some ways, having come out of a Muslim background. So I want us as a church to be in prayer for that. And also, uh, in light of his testimony, to, testimony to, to hold men like him in high regard and make sure that when he comes, um, he receives a warm welcome and um, a supportive church, okay? All right. Well, if you have your Bible, we can turn now to Colossians chapter 3, which is just after Philippians. 
Going back to this section on the family, let's have a word of prayer as we look into God's word. Father in heaven, thank you for this unique Sunday, and we come back to this portion of your word with open hearts and open minds, listening for and heeding your instruction on how to live the Christian life in our families. And Lord, I pray that you would open our ears to hear how you would speak to us, specifically this morning as individuals. Lord, some of us here are husbands and parents and wives and parents. Some of us are children. We think about our role as spouses this morning. And Lord, speak to us in a unique way that challenges us, but also encourages us and also instructs us. Lord, so many different lives and situations here this morning. And I do pray that we as a church would come under the banner of your lordship and of your instructions for us. I pray that our hearts would be inclined to hearing and listening from your word to see how it applies to me first and then also in the the group of our family, the unit of our family. Lord, these things are important to you and you've come to redeem us from every lawless deed and to redeem our families. And I pray that uh, this morning's message would contribute towards that end for us as a church. Give us strong families so that we might have a strong church. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So our series is Patterns of Christian Living, and the theme is to look at the most routine parts of the Christian life and allow Scripture to inform those routines, our daily living habits, our daily interactions with people, our daily time with God. Last week, we moved over to this more specific topic of looking at the dynamics and routines of a Christian family. And we started with the very clear notion that no family is perfect and no Christian family is perfect. We looked at a quote from Jay Adams' book, Christian Living in the Home, and the reality is that no Christian family is perfect because sinners live there. And therefore, we can't sort of imagine this unhealthy sort of unrealistic vision of what a Christian family ought to be. And sometimes you look at the own, your own problems in your own family and you look at other Christian families and you think they must be perfect, right? Well, that's unrealistic. Every family has problems because every family is made up of people who have a sinful nature and it hangs around even if you've been born again. It's called the flesh, Instead, what we should pursue, instead of this unrealistic ideal of perfection and bliss, is this realistic idea of the need for Christ to redeem our families. We come as sinners, but believing in Christ means that he's transforming our lives for the better into his image, and he will and can do that in a family. Your family should be better day by day, as each person submits their life to Christ. And the truth is, everyone has to do their part. This is so key. Everyone has to do their part. We say that to our kids when times are tough and calls for servant hearts. We say everyone has to do their part. And we can reason with them about this. We say things like, do you like living in our home and in our family? And they say, yes, we do. And we say, okay especially if there's a lot of work that needs to get done. And we say, do you like the peace and fun that we have in our home? And they say, yes. And we say, well, everyone has to do their part for that to happen. The way you speak to one another, the way you forgive one another, the way that you kick in and work together when it's needed, everyone has to do their part. And I think that's what we find distilled here in Colossians chapter 3. The Apostle Paul's instructions here for families is for the family unit. These are timeless principles for Christians, and they can be isolated topics for looking specifically at how a wife should carry out her role in the Christian home, or the functioning of a husband in his family, or how parenting should go in a Christian home. And then it carries on to servants and masters, or in today's world, employees and employers. But it comes here for the family as a unit. 
and the instructions are brief and they're clear. And so I conclude from that sort of style of what's written here that Paul is giving instructions for the family as a whole, as each person carries out their part in this redeemed blueprint that God has for families. Each person is to do their part as unto the Lord, which tells us that this is a blueprint and a pattern that is to work together, right? It's almost like mechanics. If you take your transmission out of your car, which was designed to work in concert with all the other parts of the car, if you take the transmission out, you have a large chunk of metal. It's no longer a car. It can no longer function. In a similar way, when each person does their part in a family, it works really well. And that's how God has given us and presented to us this instruction here. Last week, we looked at the passage and considered it as a whole, and there were really some uh, foundational principles that I think needed to be said at the outset to avoid certain uh, dangers and, and, and sort of common pitfalls when it comes to this passage. And the first was, do your part first. And the idea was that when it comes to family problems or family conflicts, one of the trends that I've seen is for a spouse, or it could be a child or a parent, to really emphasize and apply these instructions to everyone else around them first before applying it to themselves and their own role. And it's not that we can never use Scripture to show someone where they fall short. We should and we can. It's a matter of emphasis and also what we do first. The classic picture is of two spouses in conflict coming in for counseling and really what they're bringing is a long list of accusations against the other person. And what they really want is for the pastor to get on their side, right? I'm coming to counseling because I got to persuade the pastor that I'm right and he's wrong. Or I'm right and she's wrong. And then we'll see. It's the wrong approach to this passage. You got to do your part first. You got to look to your own sin. The primary way we should come to scripture is to hear it and ask how it applies to me. There is a place for confronting someone else, even your spouse. There is a place, of course, for giving correction to your children. But first, we have to come humbly, teachably, open to Scripture's gaze into our lives to see how God would change us. And then we'll be in a right place to talk to someone else about their sin and failings. Jesus taught this in Matthew 7. Matthew 7, 1 through 5, do not judge so that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you measure, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. And we can apply that in the context of marriage. Husbands, why do you look at the speck in your wife's eye? Why are you complaining about the meal? when there's a log in your eye, when you come home from work, angry and frustrated. First deal with the log. There's an order to this. Christ says, first do this and then, then do that. First self-examination, humbly confessing before God, whatever it is, take the, the scrupulous judgment that you've aimed at your spouse or aimed at someone else and turn it and aim it towards your own life and character. That's first. Paul restates this same idea in Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. The law of Christ is to love one another as he commanded. But the critical phrases here tell us the manner at which we should address someone else's sin and apply the scripture to them. It should be, you who are spiritual are in a good place with God, the, the, the effort should be to restore him, right? Not to condemn or accuse him, but to restore him in the spirit of gentleness, keeping watch on yourself lest you too be tempted. The temptation is in the moment not to be gentle or not to be kind or to get angry, 
or to come accusing or condemning or writing them off. And when someone's approached that way, it could be your spouse, the tendency is for them to get defensive and to argue back. And the temptation is then for you to respond in kind, and the conflict can continue to escalate. All right, so do your part first. And then do the fundamentals first. And this point last week was just about the context in which these instructions for the family come. Before this, Paul in Colossians and even more so in Ephesians spends a long time describing for every Christian in the congregation, uh, wives, husbands, parents, children, for all of them, what it means to walk with Christ. The, the, the picture that he paints in both contexts is that of putting off the former self and the deeds of the flesh and renewing your mind through God's truth and then putting on Christ and, and, and his attributes. And there's some very specific things. Notice in Colossians 3 how he ends that, that section in the preceding context. Verse 12, So as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, patience, bearing with one another and forgiving each other, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also, sh so also should you. And for our purposes, the, the idea here is apply that in your family. S children, apply that to your siblings. Husbands, apply that in, in relating to your wife. Wives to your husbands. Parents to children. Children to parents, right? If those things are undergirding your interactions as a family, things will go well. And I think some of the brevity of Paul's specific instructions to wives and husbands and children has that background in mind. He doesn't have to say a ton more because if those things are in place in our lives and we're pursuing those things in loving others, then the specifics of what a wife should do and a husband would do are, 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 are minimal. So do the fundamentals first. And the last principle last week was put the Lord Jesus first. We find in each of these commands to any Christian in any of these positions, and it could be a position of authority or under authority. It could be husbands and wives submitting to them or children submitting to their parents and their parents' position of authority. It could be slaves in submitting to their masters or masters in their position of authority. Regardless of the position or station, every one of those Specific positions is to be motivated in their conduct with a desire to please the Lord. It is for the Lord. Christian employers in those days, Christian masters who had slaves or servants, they were to conduct their authority in a Christ-like manner. Every part, every person infused and invested with Christ-like character. This morning, we want to focus on the first two pairs here, and, and they do come in pairs. We have wives and husbands, and then children to parents, and then slaves to masters. The first pair here speaks to marriage, and there are two words of exhortation that Paul gives. Number one, a word to the wives, and then a second, a word to husbands. So we begin this morning with a word to the wives, and that is submit, submit. The unique and specific command here for wives is, is submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Verse 18. This is a direct command to the Christian wives in the church. And this verb here, submit, is the Greek word hupotasso, and it means placing yourself under someone else. Voluntarily placing yourself under someone's authority. And that means it comes with an attitude of humility, and an attitude of cooperation with that person, a willingness to comply with their leadership direction. And this is the command to wives. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Few qualifications here. This is obviously a hot topic, a hot button topic in our culture and even in the church. And so a few things. What Paul is not doing here is upholding and supporting the results of fallen humanity. All right? That's so important. Because it's often caricatured in the culture that the Bible is an archaic book and it supports and endorses abuse in the home. That's not what Paul's saying here. You realize that in the ancient Near East, in the first century, 
Paul was surrounded by abuse in the home, specifically of women. And that is not the result of the Bible. That is a result of sin. There were specific functions in the very first creation of Adam and Eve before sin, and it involved Adam's leadership and Eve's being a suitable helper and support before sin. When sin came in, it ruined that. It took what was meant to be a loving, supportive, mutually beneficial structure for marriage, and it marred it, and it turned it into something ugly. And that's where we live. That's where Paul lived, right? What Paul is doing is not saying, yeah, that's how we should roll in the family. But also, he is not undoing that structure which was created in the beginning. There's a lot to say on that, <laughs> but it's an important qualification. Paul is not upholding male chauvinism, abuse in the whole home, sinful domination of men over women, making women subservient to men. That's not what he's doing. But he is calling Christian wives, nevertheless, to submit to their husbands, to recognize that God has placed the, the, the husband and the father to be the primary leader in the home. That is a God-given position. And your husband will be held accountable to God in that role. And your job is to humbly submit to him and also support and acknowledge that position. A couple other qualifiers. Paul is specific that this is in the context of marriage. So this is not a command for all women to submit to all men everywhere. This is a command to wives to submit to their husbands. Also, this is not a statement on ontology. This is not about women being inferior to men ontologically, as far as their being goes, or their essence. This pertains to their particular function in the home. There is a uh, equivalent parallel to our understanding of the Trinity, right? We believe that God is one in essence and distinct in three persons. One God, three persons within the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the Son is equal to the Father in deity, in essence. But the Son is not the Father. And being the Son, He has always positioned Himself in submission to the Father's will. And we see that very clearly in His incarnation. The Father did not become man, but the Son became man and embraced full humanity in submission to His Father's will. And it was glad, joyful submission. The same goes for His sinless life and His full obedience to the Father and then His death on the cross. And this does not mean that Christ, the Son of God, is inferior to the Father in his being. He's not. He is equal as God. It's similar in the context of marriage, that functionally, wives are to follow their husband's leadership. They are not equal and it's or symmetrical in that function. There is an asymmetry there, and that asymmetry is complementary. You might find that in general, when men work together with other men, it is often combative and there's a clash. Just try working with your father on a project at home. <laughs> right? <laughs> there are great pains and effort and enthusiasm put towards having men submit to other men in the army. Right? And you might find that Oftentimes, women are more naturally inclined to be very supportive and cooperative and complementary in bringing their strengths to fill in the gaps with men's weakness. That's how God intended it to be, complementary. So this is not about the inferiority of women, but it is about a kind of blueprint and pattern that God has made for the home functionally. For example, Paul in Galatians 3 makes it very clear that when it comes to the church, there is something that is actually a gain in God redeeming men and women roles in light of justification by faith that makes it so that in the church, the acknowledgement of 
The, the equality of women and men in the church is now better from the culture around them. Galatians 3, 26, For you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. And he's talking about them all being justified by faith apart from the works of the law and so that they have a right standing with God and have become children of Abraham and recipients of the covenant by faith in Christ. Here are the, the sort of sociological results. He says there is neither Jew nor Greek. So ethnic distinctions that before this had come to bear in Jew-Gentile relations are abolished now. There is neither Jew nor Greek in light of justification by faith. There is neither slave nor free, right? So no caste systems in the church. There is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is not abolishing gender distinctions there. But what he is saying is that in light of full justification by faith, there is no more need for distinction of status based upon gender in the church. Think the court of women in the temple. At the temple represented proximity towards God. And there was a court for women to gather and pray in the temple, but it was not as close as for men. Not, not anymore in the church. Women have full access to God to boldly approach his throne because they have been justified by faith just as much as men. So ontologically, in essence, they are equal, but not in function in the home. Another qualifier. This is not to be applied to your boyfriend. If your boyfriend is not your husband, you don't need to submit to him. If your boyfriend is asking you to submit to him, that's a red flag. Nor, another qualifier, that this command to submit is also not just for wives in the church. Christians get this command across the board. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 5. And this kind of colors, colors this command to wives, but it also col colors the husband's role in the church. Again, in Ephesians 5, we're in the broader context of Christian living that leads into the more specific commands for the home. Look at verse 15. We'll go to 15 to 21. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of the time because the days are evil. So then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Be controlled and directed by the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Now he has three, uh, three linking verbs that go along from that. They're, they're, they're participles in the Greek, and they relate to this main command, be filled with the Spirit, and they demonstrate how this follows through in Christian living, being filled with the Spirit. Number one, verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing and making melody with your heart to the Lord. So being filled with the Spirit overflows in that way that we speak to one another and also sing privately to ourselves and to one another about the truths of God. Number uh, Verse 20, also always giving thanks for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to God, even the Father. And verse 21, and being subject to one another in the fear of Christ. That's our verb to submit. So there is a sense, a very clear sense, in which spirit-filled attitudes of every believer is to submit to one another mutually, to be ready to respond to another believer in helping them and doing what they ask. In small things, big things, right? That's part of walking in the spirit, being filled with the spirit, right? And so Christians across the board are called to Submit. And then Paul goes in, in the next verse, wives, submit to your own husbands. This is a specific example. I want you to see how this truth is also played out in 1 Peter 2. All right, 1 Peter 2. We've talked about this principle in this passage before, so I won't spend too much time here. The theme of this section in Peter's letter, which is a letter given to a variety of churches to, to be circulated throughout the Roman Empire, 
He talks here about submitting as Christians to various authorities in our lives, and even specifically submitting when it involves being mistreated by those authorities. The first one he talks about is the government, verse 13. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether to a king as one in authority or to governors as sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and the praise of those who do right. For such is the will of God that by doing right, you may silence the ignorance of foolish men. And so the first aspect for all Christians is submit to the governing authorities. It continues the same principle to servants submitting to their masters. Verse 18, servants be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. <clears throat> the same concept he addresses to wives in chapter 3, verse 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. And then even to husbands, look at verse 7 of chapter 3. Likewise, he says, so this same theme of submitting to authority and then even submitting when being treated unjustly, there is a kind of way that a husband submits to his wife, not to relinquish his position of leadership, that doesn't happen, not to know he's responsible for leading his family spiritually, for making wise decisions ultimately, but in the manner that, that he, he relates to his wife. Live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life. See, show honor to your wife. Live with your wives in an understanding way. Understand as much as you can about her. Show her honor. Respect her. Lift her up. Because she is heirs with you of the grace of life. Christ died for your wife. She has an internal, eternal inheritance like you because of Christ. This should change and, 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 and inform the manner at which you live as a husband, all right? Ultimately, this broader theme of living in submission to authority is following Christ's example. And that's the fourth principle and qualification for wives, is that in part, when you submit to your husband, you are following Christ's example. Look at the heart of this passage in um, verse 21. 1 Peter 2.21. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. Now this tells me a couple things that are practical for this, um, this point. Peter adds a layer of uh, specification here that it's not just about submission, but submitting when it's hard, submitting when we're mistreated by those in authority over us. And that's why he puts Christ and his suffering here as our example. And it tells me two things. Number one, that when it comes to submitting to authority, we cannot excuse ourselves from submitting to God-given authority, even if for whatever reason, we have rendered and determined that that person is not worthy of our respect of their position. We can't do that. The government in place at this time, Peter writes, is Rome and the emperor is Nero. Okay? We can't say, I'm not submitting to or praying to our president because don't you know what he believes? That doesn't qualify. That's not Christian to do that. You can't say as a wife, yeah, I would submit to my husband, but he's a terrible spiritual leader, so I'm not doing it. That doesn't work. Peter makes that specific here in chapter 3, verse 1. Be submissive to your own husband so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. We can't excuse ourselves from submitting to authority just because we don't like it. And it can be extremely subjective, right? All they have to do is tell us something we don't want to hear. 
And then we find a reason why they're no longer in a position of authority or that their authority is valid anymore. It can be very subjective. And that's not, that's not what Peter's calling for here. That's not humble. It's not submissive. Notice the key for Christ's submission while he was being treated unjustly. This is so key. At the end of verse 23, it says, He continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. That is so key. When you find yourself in a position under someone's authority and you know that God has called you to submit to that authority and they're difficult to deal with, the key is that I trust and submit to God and trust that he's put me in this position and I can trust their and submit to their authority. I'll give you a silly illustration just to lighten the mood here. <laughs> when I went to seminary, we had to wear ties. And I just thought that was the most arbitrary rule there was. And I, I totally wanted to rebel against it. I wanted to like wear it around my head, you know, just to push against it a little bit. But I realized, you know, there's a reason for this. And if God has brought me to this seminary, I believed he had. And if they're in charge of rules, including wearing a tie, then I'm going to find a God-honoring reason to wear my tie in submitting to that authority. And I did. I just thought, well, I'll, as I tighten this around my neck, I feel like it's kind of a, a weight. And, and this is going to remind me that I have an obligation to, to, to work hard while I'm here because of the responsibility to teach God's word. And I put that thing on every day and it was fine. I got over it. It was fine. I submitted to the authority even though I didn't, wouldn't necessarily make the rule myself, but it had a reason. And I said, okay, Lord, if this is what you've placed me under, then not, no problem. I can do this. And in that small example, I'm, I'm really submitting to their authority because I'm submitting to God's sovereignty in the position that he has placed me. Now, of course, there's, there's a qualification there. If someone in authority is commanding you to disobey and sin against God, obey God rather than men, right? We all know that. Live free or die. We all know it in New Hampshire. If your husband tells you to sin, disobey him, of course. But otherwise, an attitude of submission. And you're not alone. You're not alone because Christians across the board are called to submit to some authority in their life. And you're not alone because Christ is submitting and has submitted always to his Father. There is something unique in carrying out the life of a wife that you are walking with Jesus in this unique way. Two remaining details from Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3. First, a comparison. Notice in Ephesians 5, you turn back there, 22, Paul says, Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord, as to the Lord. So for guidance on this, Paul gives us a comparison. And that is, it's analogous to the church's submission to Christ. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. And the idea is, as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ also is the head of the church, he himself being the savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, that's the comparison, so also wives ought to be to their husbands in everything. How does this play out? Well, for the church, we're the model, right? We, because of the cross and his great love for us, we've given our allegiance to him and our love for him in response, and we trust him, and we, we come to him with teachable spirits and a heart that says, your will be done and Lord lead me and I will follow. And we desire to serve the Lord and his mission in the world. And so Christian wives make Christ first in their hearts. They submit themselves to the Lord, but then also specifically in their role in marriage and ministry really in marriage as a wife, it is to be to submit to their husband's in a similar way. And this is really to be the default mode. Notice that Paul says, so wives ought to, um, to be to their own husbands. And then he says, in everything at the end of the verse. That's a lot. And I think with the rest of scripture in mind, we, we know that there are, there is an exception for not sinning, right? Or not following them into idolatry or something like that, right? But the idea is that this is the default mode. 
that in everything, that in major discussions and major decisions or disagreements or really getting behind and supporting your husband as a suitable helper, that this is the overall default mode in marriage. And the comparison is there as the church submits to Christ. Another um, detail here, back in Colossians 3, verse 18 again, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Now, this is different than what Paul says in Ephesians 5. It's not a comparison with the church here. It's another added nuance. And the key word there is fitting, and it means as is proper. And I think what Paul means is, as it is proper for you who are in the Lord. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting you being in the Lord. Being in the Lord is one of Paul's favorite all-encompassing phrases to describe the essential status of a Christian. That is, by faith we've been united to Christ and are in Christ. He says it all over his letters. And so, wives, being in Christ then, it is proper and fitting for a Christian woman in her ministry as a wife in marriage to be submissive to her husband. And this is in contrast to other kinds of attitudes, being brazen or contentious or downright rebellious or very strong-willed or overly opinionated or taking it upon yourself as the one to call the final shots. Or if you don't get your way as a wife, then you throw a tie, go into a tirade or, or silent treatment, right? And it makes life miserable in your home. We had a saying in, in, in my extended family, um, if mama's not happy, ain't nobody happy, <laughs> okay? Proverbs talks about this in somewhat humorous ways. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Proverbs 21.9. Proverbs 21.19. It is better to live in a desert than with a quarrelsome and fretful woman. Proverbs 25.24. It is better to live in a corner of the housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Proverbs 19.13. A foolish son is a destruction to his father. And the, contentious, the contentions of a wife are a constant dripping. Proverbs 27, 15. A continual dripping on a rainy day and a quarrelsome wife are alike. Several times there in Proverbs it points to this. And I think that's what Paul has in mind when he says, Submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. It's a token of godliness to live and conduct yourself as a wife in the home in this way. Now again, sinners live there, right? Sinners live there. And one of the essential features of the sinful nature, both for men and women, is rebellion. <laughs> we rebel against authorities. That is our default mode, which is why in 1 Peter 2, it's so important for Christians to not do that. But it does show up in the context of a marriage, and Paul is calling Christian wives away from that. And so part of living out this new life in Christ as a Christian woman as a wife in a marriage, is again a putting off of the old self and the inclinations of the flesh, which will come out in those kinds of things, in the way you relate to your husband and speak to your husband and your attitudes and how you work through a conflict or disagreements. The flesh will come out in those things, but rather put on, putting on Christ as a Christian wife, it is then fitting and appropriate in Christ that your ministry to your family is marked by humility, kindness, support, being cooperative and submissive to your husband. Now listen, this is, this is somewhat of a, a, of, a, of a near and dear subject for me, <laughs> not because I want my wife to do this well. <laughs> the way I think about this is long before there were any mega churches out there to sort of stun and entertain the masses of Christians with superficiality. Long before that was ever a dominant trend in evangelicalism, there was the wonder of stalwart, brave, God-loving women in the home. And they raised children 
who became preachers and missionaries who revolutionized the world. We read about them in 1 Timothy. Mother Eunice and your grandmother Lois, who taught you the scriptures. We hear about Jonathan Edwards' mother and how much she prayed and how devout she was in light of how many kids she had, right? There is a power to godly women in the home, and it is, it is way more profound than the superficialities we're stunned with today. This is what Peter means when he says in 1 Peter 3, women, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. I think a better translation might be Sir. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. There's this, there's this timeless beauty to the character that Paul is calling for here for Christian wives. And that's what it means to, to follow Christ in that specific role. Ultimately, it's submitting to Christ, but then also carrying this out in submitting to your husband. So much more to say on that. If you are interested in knowing what I mean about all kinds of attending questions and implications there, a couple books, The Fulfilled Family, God's Design for Your Home by John MacArthur, and then also a very, very thorough book called Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood, edited by John Piper and Wayne Grudem. All right. A word to husbands, number two. And I think we'll cut this short this morning because there's more I'd like to say to husbands. Right? We said a lot to the wives, right? I don't want you to think that I'm letting the husbands off, uh, getting, uh, getting them off the hook too easy. Verse 19, husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Or in the New American Standard, husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. The key term here, harsh or bitter, can be used literally for undrinkable water or for a sour or upset stomach. And here I think it describes an attitude of anger or prolonged bitterness or a grudge-bearing inclination or resentment that overflows into harsh treatment of your wives. And men, this morning, if that's you, then there is a serious problem in your marriage. It means that you're not actively loving your wife. And the reality is that this blueprint that Paul gives cannot work unless you are doing your part. And even if necessary, leading in living out this pattern. I think it's important for us to realize how much of a struggle it puts on our wife when we are harsh and unloving to them. I mean, think about it. What is her response going to be inclined to be? That she is lovingly submissive and supportive? If you're harsh and unloving towards her? No. She's going to be tempted to be harsh and unloving back, right? It's a temptation there. Especially if it's sustained. And if you've been married long enough, maybe you know what this is like, right? get into a conflict. There's no forgiveness. It leads to bitterness and resentment and grudge bearing. And soon almost all of your conversations are tailored that way, right? There's just this atmosphere of contention in the home. Hus husbands, if that's the status in your home this morning, let me place the responsibility and burden on you to stop, right? You've got to love your wife. And Paul says here, not be harsh with them. I remember in this unforgettable sermon that Pastor Bodie Bauckham preached at a shepherd's conference out in Los Angeles while I was in seminary. He gave an illustration of a husband coming to him for counsel. And this man came to him and said, Pastor, it is so bad in my home. You don't understand how this woman treats me. Everything has changed since we first were married. She insults me in front of our friends. She constantly points out my faults. She doesn't respect me at all. And Pastor Vodibakum said, well, hold on a second, brother. God commands you 
in Ephesians 5 and Colossians 3, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The man backed up a bit and responded, well, I don't think she should even count as my wife anymore. We are like two strangers living under the same roof. You don't understand what it's like. And he interrupted him and said, hold on a second. God said to us that the second greatest commandment was to love your neighbor as yourself. She's your closest neighbor, so love your wife. He said, you know, I don't think you're getting it, Pastor. You don't understand. There is not a moment's peace in our house. I mean, she is constantly stirring up arguments. Anytime she speaks to me, it just leads to, to yelling and screaming. It's like living with an enemy in my own home. And the pastor said, wait a second. Jesus commanded us, but I say to you, love your enemies. You need to love your wife. And his point was, look, there is no excuse that you have as a husband not to love your wife. So love your wife was his counsel. And this gets back to that first of three principles from last week. The first was do your part first. And I think this applies particularly and directly to husbands. The analogy for us, the comparison for us in Ephesians 5 is that we love our wives. Verse 25, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And we can ask the question very simply, how did Christ start loving the church? And when did Christ start loving the church? When did he initiate his love for the church? The answer is in Ephesians 1, before the foundation of the world. Ephesians 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessings in the heavenly places, just as he chose us before him, uh, in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons. God in Trinity, Father and Son, from all eternity past, determined to display his great love for the church through the cross. That was the plan. It was to magnify how great his love was for his bride. And it was not because of how lovely his bride was. Even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. There is an initiating kind of love that Christ has for the church. While we were sinners, not because we were so lovely, but because of how loving he is. And Christian husbands are called to do the same. Don't wait for your wife. There's problems in your marriage. You start loving her. Do your part first. Do the fundamentals. Colossians 3, keep thinking the things above, husbands. Set your mind on things above, husbands. Consider the members of your earthly body as dead to the works of the flesh, husbands. Put these things all aside, husbands. Put that off, but put this on. Verse 12, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with your wife in love. If you have a complaint against your wife, forgiving your wife, as the Lord has forgiven you, husbands, so you also must forgive your wives. And above all these things, put on love for your wives, which binds everything together in perfect harmony, and let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, husbands, to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful, be thankful for your wife, husbands. And husbands, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing yourself and your family with all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, husbands, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. If you just do that, your family will start to follow. You will be leading well. Your wife will be inclined to follow you. She will, especially if she is a Christian, begin to see the character of Christ, the Christ who she loves. She will begin to see that and feel that in your character. And, and she will respond. It will be so much easier for her to submit to that when you love in that way. Well, I think we're out of time for this morning. So husbands, 
Uh, you're in for it again next week. <laughs> Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this time. Lord, these things are principles that many people know. Many wives here know these things. Many husbands here know these things. And it sounds profound. It is profound to know them. But Lord, the, the key is not knowing them, but applying them. And often applying them in ways that are not profound, but are very simple. In ways that we speak to one another. In ways that we think about ourselves and, 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 and either elevate ourselves or elevate those around us. Putting their needs before our own. So Lord, as we go home and we, we interact daily this week, especially with our families, I pray for the husbands and wives here that your spirit would, would, would fill them and give them uh, genuine hearts of love and thanksgiving, desire to reconcile and to forgive, to apply these things that we have heard. Help us do them in small ways and in routine ways for your glory and for the good of those around us. I pray this for myself as well, Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.